Hi, this is Bob Scully and welcome to another edition of The World Show, our Free Markets series. This week's guest, John A. Allison of North Carolina, a distinguished professor at the School of Business at Wake Forest University, could be speaking to us as a banker, a CEO, an entrepreneur. He's received numerous awards on all three counts, but he's here to do a book report, much as one of his students might do. He's here to talk about an author he admires enormously, Ayn Rand, author of many books, including Atlas Shrugged, a book which is enjoying a uh, considerable renaissance across North America and the world today. He's here to tell us why and to communicate his profound belief in what Ayn Rand wrote and maybe talk to us a little bit about the U.S. economy and where it went wrong. Here's Professor Allison. John Allison, it seems as if everybody and his brother or sister is reading Ayn Rand and the name has been floating out there for a long time. She's not a recent author. What's she about and why the sudden interest? Well, Ayn Rand is uh, immigrated from Russia. She was a victim of the Russian Revolution, really. Her family was, uh, business was destroyed. She snuck over to the United States and then she wrote a number of books, but two monumental world-changing books in my view, both The Fountainhead and The Atlas Shrug. Uh, Atlas Shrug was written in 1957. She wrote it, she said, for the purpose of her predictions not c coming true. And unfortunately, her predictions are coming true, <laughs> and that's why people are so interested in her ideas. Prediction being that government takes over everything. Right. The trend toward statism driven by philosophical beliefs that were anti-individualistic and that th those ideas would in end up with a very status society. And it's funny how she ever got those ideas. I can understand the Russian Revolution, like you say, her father, uh, I think his business was taken over with, with the Russian Revolution. She came over at the age of 21, so the big scar there. But she uh, w was in Hollywood and, and so on, really left-leaning areas of the world, we can say that. Uh, and then she went through the 30s. Uh, which was uh, which was a period of great uh, you know union activity and so on in the U.S. Um, she was all by her lonesome with these ideas, or she, not? She absolutely was. She was uh, totally out of sync with the world she lived in. But it, uh, on the other hand, she understood how evil communism was. She had seen it in person, so she had a really strong commitment to present the ideas that underlie free society. And and she studied philosophy. She uh, studied Aristotle in particular and history, and she grasped the implications of where we were going that a lot of people just didn't see. And it, she wrote Atlas Shrugged, I guess, is the one that, that remains the most read. I believe it is the one that, that, is, yes. that is now selling in, in, uh, in its uh, newer editions. Um, that was written in 57. Now, those are the Eisenhower years, again, a mystery to me. You would have thought that in those years, all, all this, uh, all this uh, sort of leftist, uh, power, you know, the stuff that was in fashion in the 30s, had, and people knew about Stalin by then. Uh, he died in '53. It seems to me um, she, she she should have been happy with the way American society was going in '57. Right? What she grasps is that ideas ultimately drive action, and she saw the new intellectuals at that time uh, in the universities, the very left-wing intellectuals that showed up in the 1960s, uh, as having ideas that would be very destructive. Rand is ultimately an advocate of. of what I'd call virtuous human action, that people need a sense of purpose, that reason is their means of survival, that they have to think effectively, and that they should try to achieve self-esteem through earning uh, the right to feel good about yourself by having a productive, meaningful life. And she thought that individuals needed to do that in their own way as free, independent human beings. And I want you to tell me about the, this is, this is not out of Ayn Rand, this is out of a speech you gave. I want to hear about the sandbox because I want to get into this question of, of, of self-interest, but, but uh, tell me about the sandbox. All right. Well, one of Rand's fundamental ideas is people should pursue their rational self-interest properly understood. And it is in the context that, that most people believe that human beings are born bad. And the reason we're, we're bad is we're selfish, and, and selfish is, is supposed mm -hmm. to be bad. So you can see Johnny in the sandbox at three or four years old, having a good time, playing with his truck, not bothering anybody. Along comes Fred. Fred wants Johnny's truck. Johnny doesn't want to give it to him. Uh, mom, dad, Sunday school teacher, kindergarten teacher gets involved in the discussion, the argument by now, and says, hey, Johnny, give your truck to Fred. Don't be selfish. Don't be bad. Uh, and, and there's two moral lessons being taught there. We're, we're, first, where did Fred get the moral right to the, to the truck, <laughs> right? That's where our welfare system comes from, right there, right in the sandbox. But more important, what about Johnny? 
What Johnny learned is that his life is secondary, that, that Fred's needs and desires are more important than his, and that he fundamentally doesn't have the right to pursue his own happiness. And that is a very destructive idea. What, what Rand said is that we shouldn't try to take advantage of other people, but we shouldn't self-sacrifice either. Each of us has a moral right of our, our own lives. And what we ought to do is be traders, trade value for value, get better together. That life is really about creating win-win relationships, not sacrificing other people nor sacrificing ourselves. And that is the idea that underlies a free society. But at the same time, I've noticed a lot of people who are objectivists or fans of, of, of Ayn Rand have been in their lives very generous. They have not hesitated to give of their wealth and so on. And so uh, the, the, that's why I was saying self-interest. There's a fine line here that, that there's a, uh, the, the moralization of, of self-interest turns into selfishness, which is so-called bad. But nobody's denying that generosity is good. Absolutely true. Rand basically said you had to hold the context, and this is what people do. Selfish is not about taking advantage of other people. In fact, that's self-defeating. Nor is it a, a, a kind of a linear, what I call a narcissist view of the world. It's holding the context and saying, what kind of world would I like to live in? And what would I enjoy doing helping create that kind of world? So, so, they, so for example, I support the United Way because I don't believe I would want to live in the kind of community that would exist if there wasn't a United Way, which is an umbrella charity organization, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't want my children to live there. I don't do it in a sacrificial manner, but I do it because it matters the quality of life that I have. So, so objectivism is not about being blind to other people. It's recognizing human relationships matter, but it's about not sacrificing for other people. It's about pursuing your rational self-interest, holding the context. That means having a sense of purpose, taking care of your body, taking care of your mind, and trying to create healthy human relationships. It's interesting, people say the world's bad because people are selfish. Here's the irony, very few people really are selfish. Most mm -hmm. people don't have a sense of purpose. They don't take care of themselves, right? They don't work to create good relationships. What if everybody did that? What if everybody had a good sense of purpose, took care of their mind, took care of their body, worked to create healthy human relationships? Wow, wouldn't the world be better? You know, and, and, and there's uh, something else that I've, I've uh, often discussed with, with people who are fans of Ayn Rand is um, the notion, sometimes um, uh, I, there was a famous sentence, I, I forget who said it, that socialism had the best ideas but the worst practice. In other words, they, they, they say that it's going to be wonderful, but then when you look at the results, you're staring at the exact opposite. Um, this idea of preaching to others, and Fred, when he takes the truck away, <laughs> he's sort of, he's on the cusp of that. He's learning to, to be entitled, to feel entitled, right. and to preach to others. But isn't that a, that's, that's human nature. It's going to be hard to get rid of that in any society. Well, well, Rand's argument is that, no, we actually teach people to believe that. That as human beings, we're basically born a, a blank slate, slate in terms of our ideas. We learn our ideas from our culture. And there have been times in history, like the, the early Americans didn't think that way, right? They were self-sufficient, personally responsible. That was a culture. We've taught people how to become dependent, how to become uh, welfare recipients in a certain sense. And she actually mm -hmm. argues it's very destructive for the people that get the money, they lose part of their soul. That actually you get pride in yourself through your work, through taking mm -hmm. care of yourself, through personal responsibility, and you raise self-esteem that way. So there's a price to being dependent. But we teach people, would be her argument, to have those beliefs. They aren't natural. Uh, we're not naturally mm -hmm. that way. And there are a lot of welfare states, not just the United States, that are beginning to reach in Canada, Germany, France. They're realizing that, first of all, it's a blank check. The, the, the right. bill just keeps going up and you can't pay it. Um, but the transition back to something else, you talk about the early Americans, it was a simpler, it was a simpler right. time. True. We can't deny that. How would we ever, in this modern, complex world, how, how will we transition back to that if we are to do it? She believes it's really about the ideas that we teach our children and particularly the ideas we teach in our universities. That we didn't go in, say in America from life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness to the redistributive state by chance. Basically left-wing ideas actually came out of Europe, took over our universities, we've taught our future leaders, like the current administration is an example, uh, these ideas and, and those ideas are really what describes human action. So what she's arguing we need to do, introduce New ideas that are old ideas. Uh -huh. Individual rights, free markets, personal responsibility, and, and make those the ideas that our leaders express and that we select the kind of people that believe in those kind of concepts. 
And how much pain will be involved in the transition? Let's say we get leaders who start you know, all over the Western world to think and talk like that and say, okay, we've got to balance budgets. We're not going to have programs we can't afford. You know, all, the whole slew of it. Um, there's got to be pain there. Yeah. And there's got to be somebody somewhere less equipped to deal with it. Then what? Because that'll be on TV, right? Yeah, be, that, that's one of the challenges. Here, here in the United States, for example, we have uh, a potential really serious financial problem. In 20, 25 years, the United States mathematically certainly goes broke. It's, mm -hmm. You run the numbers, we go yeah. broke. And you're, you're yeah. actually generous with 25 yeah, years. Yeah, it may be shorter. Yeah, it could at this rate, yeah. So, so we have to do something. It's, it's analogous, I think, to having uh, a, a form of terminal cancer. Now, the good news, the cancer is treatable, but the bad news, it will be painful. And so there will be pain involved in it, but if we don't go through the pain, then we will die in a certain sense as a country. We will, have, we will end up being a third world economy. So th I, think, I think not everybody, I think the majority of people can be convinced of going through the pain if they understand the consequences and they understand that in the long term our children and grandchildren will be dramatically better off. If you think about it, what we're doing to our children and grandchildren is immoral. And I don't think many people really want to do that. If you ask me, uh, would I like to set up the kind of world where my grandchildren are going to face serious economic problems versus sacrificing mm -hmm. today? I'll sacrifice today in a heartbeat. Not, not because I, I don't care about my own life, but, but I do feel a certain kind of love for my children and my, and my grandchildren that I, that's important to me. And I don't want to be responsible for not giving them a good chance to be happy. And what happens, because again, I'm thinking in media terms, because that's my business, that's my industry. <laughs> right. um, what happens when, it, when the pain becomes dramatic and, you know, um, well, for instance, when a city goes bankrupt, and, and there's no, you know, the sewer service and all those things just cannot function, we might say, well, that's, the, you know, they asked for it, it's time to, but meanwhile, the toilet's overflowing. I mean, <laughs> when it gets very nitty gritty, is, is a little bit of gas in the car allowed or not? Well, here's what I think. If we actually allocated our resources rationally, we, would, we could certainly have good sewage. We could certainly, I mean, if you look at the, the amount of money we spend on things that don't need to be done, it's pretty stunning. Yes, yes. correct. <laughs> and, Absolutely and, correct. And, and a lot of our challenges for commitments that we've made, we've got an out-of-control cost in Medicare, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, what we need to do is move back to a private medical system. Look, look at food. Food's more important than medicine. If you don't have any food, you mm -hmm. die for you, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, food costs as a percentage of our budget has been in a free fall. And yet, we have basically very limited in interference in the food market by the government. It's the government's interference in the medical market that's created an incredibly inefficient system. Or in case of, of countries like Canada, where there's a huge rationing of health care mm -hmm. that leads to really big problems mm -hmm. in the long term. And what we need to do is privatize medicine. I mean, it needs to be a 20-year program because we didn't get here in two weeks. That's right, yeah. That, but the that's what I'm wondering. The, the discipline of the market, there would almost, this is an interesting thing. Printing money to spend on things you don't need to do, which is what we've been doing, is not going to raise your standard of living. You know that at home, right? And yes, I think the course. immediate... As soon as business people grasped that the United States was having discipline, that we weren't going to go broke, they would be more optimistic and they'd be more willing to make investments and we could drive a faster growth rate. Because the real mathematical solution for our problems is dramatically improving the economic growth rate. And that depends on people's confidence that they're going to be able to innovate, be creative, be free, not be overregulated, not be overtaxed. Mm -hmm. So I just, I think if we had the right picture of the future, while there'd be some pain in the short term, people could grasp that picture and see how much better they and their, and their grandchildren would be better off. And I think then the, the pain would be a lot less dramatic. And, and, and we're still well, a wealthy society, so we, we, we can take care of the toilets and things like that. So we would, there would be a little bit of a uh, band-aid or whatever you want to call it, some kind of social engineering to kind of uh, mop up the worst messes and... Well, here, the social engineering to me was we could, we could eliminate nine out of ten regulations. Regulatory cost in the United States exceeds taxes. And I know in the banking business, if you ask me what would I rather do, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a get rid of regulations. So, and 95% and of these regulations are actually destructive instead of productive. You could free up huge amounts of human resources in very short periods of time. So I, 
I, yeah, you need a mandate, but I don't think you need social engineering. What I think you need is a free society and a free market. And I was thinking of Ayn Rand, who loved clear and, you know, clear and, uh, well, as Reagan used to say, the things, the things may not be uh, easy, but they can be simple. Right. I didn't say it exactly like that, but it right. came to that. Um, I was thinking that she might have turned her guns from government if she'd been around in the past couple of years to Wall Street. Am I correct? And she might have blasted them. Well, she blasted what, we, what I call crony capitalism. Well, she pointed out that many business people were actually the worst kind of socialists and statists and that they wanted a free lunch from the government. Mm -hmm. And she would be highly critical of crony, crony, crony capitalists. And clearly we've seen a lot of that. People that get favors from the government get bailed out when they shouldn't get bailed out. And she would be, and she always was adamantly opposed to that. But she did point out, you know, in the United States we have separation of church and, and, and state. We, she said, well, look, the reason we have crony capitalists is because the government can dole out favors. If we really uh -huh. had a limited government and they couldn't go out favors to Wall Street, there wouldn't be any benefit to being a crony capitalist. But you could have crooks on Wall Street in, inventing, inventing all kinds of funds and so on and derivatives. I mean, you, you, uh, she, she, I, I think she would have wanted to punish them as well because they brought the whole thing down. Well, now we're getting into. I don't. I, yes, there were crooks on Wall Street, but in my view, I, I was a banker. Remember, twenty years. Yes, I know. In my view, they played a trivial role. The cause of the financial crisis in the United States was primarily the Federal Reserve printed too much money, trying to avoid a correction, because Greenspan wanted the, the head of the Federal Reserve wanted never to have bad times. Mm -hmm. That bubble, massive, too much money, went into the housing market because of affordable housing policies imposed by the federal government through Freddie and Fannie. And Fannie Mae, yeah. And so, yes, Wall Street played a role, and I would let those guys fail, and, I, and I'd put the crooks in jail, but they were very secondary to government policy. The government was trying to drive home ownership above the natural market rate. They've been working on it for years, and they set up a disaster by subsidizing and encouraging people to buy houses that they couldn't afford. And, it, and for banks, we were under an intense pressure to do high-risk uh, home loans to meet this affordable housing goal. And, and to, your, to your credit, because you were a banker and we can talk about that, yours refused to do that. We All did. the way, not just at the last minute. We did. And in our case, it was what, a matter of principle. And this really came from, from Rand, is, uh, that we believe that we should act in principle. One of the commitments in our mission, one of our purposes, is to help our clients be economically successful and financially secure. And one thing I've told our, our employees many times over the years, never, ever do anything that you know will be bad for your client. Even if you can make a profit in the short term, because it'll always come back to haunt you in the long term. And if you do the right things for your client, you'll be successful in the long term. We knew these, these kinds of loans, particularly what they called negative amortization loans. Where yeah, you, where, where you're paying nothing, really. <laughs> right, you're paying less than the interest rate. Mm -hmm. It was a disaster for young people. So we said, we're not going to do this ethically because we think it's the wrong thing to do. In the time, we made less money, and we were criticized for not doing it. But we, I knew that I didn't want to look some young guy in the, in the I five years after we'd set him, we'd set him down a path mm -hmm, that we knew mm -hmm. was going to be a disaster. House. Yeah. And, and so we didn't do it over ethics. But the, uh, people doing that the way you did it, were pretty rare at the time. True. And as you True. say, you were criticized. Uh, did True. people mock you and say you were passing up uh, good business opportunities? Sure. That, I don't know if they mock, but they, they, they criticized and said, we, you know, and our stock price was good, but it wasn't as good as it could have been in the short term. It's a lot better now <laughs> than the people that did it. Uh, but I would say this, there was a huge amount of governmental pressure to do those loans. I mean, it wasn't that people just did them all voluntarily to make mm -hmm. a profit. There was a lot of government pressure to do affordable housing. And uh, the irony, and this is a central irony, and, uh, and, and it comes up in, in the research on you, you had to take TARP funds, $3 billion, I think it was, uh, troubled asset relief program. Yeah. You had to take it, and you were happy to pay it back with the interest as quickly as you could. But why did you have to take it? You know, that's a really sad story. <laughs> I was adamantly opposed to TARP. I was the only CEO of a large financial institution in the U.S. that wrote Congress. I, I did everything I could to stop TARP because I thought it was going to be a long-term disaster, and I still think it's going to be because mm -hmm. I think we were keeping in business firms that should fail, and I think that's bad for the economy in the long term. Anyway, after TARP passed, I got an interesting call from our regulator, and, and they, they said this very obliquely because regulators do this, but basically this is the essence of what they said. They said, John, you know, bb t has way more capital than you need based on the regulatory standards we've had for 25 years. However, we've decided to change the capital standards. We don't know what the new capital standards are going to be, but we're confident if you don't take TARP, you won't have enough capital. And we have an audit team coming in in the next couple of days to see that unless you take TARP. But if you had more capital, were they saying that they were going to change them in such a severe way that nobody could have, nobody, nobody could have survived? Or, or apply it differently to us. 
And, and the, here's the reason for that. And remember, we don't have rule of law. We have rule of regulators. Regulators make up the law any way they want to. Bernanke, the head of the Federal Reserve, was, is a student of the Depression. And during the Depression, individual banks got help from the government, but it didn't work because the market jumped up. What Bernanke realized were three large financial institutions getting ready to fail. He thought that if he just helped those companies, the it market would wouldn't work. So he tried to, for he did, force all the large banks, all the $100 billion and over banks to participate, including all the healthy banks, because then it would obscure the banks that were being bailed out. And he, and he really used the excuse that he was trying to motivate banks to make loans. So that phone call was really muscle. It was, oh, of course. And, it, and, and that's not, that happens all the time. It's always, you know, they say it very carefully, <laughs> but you get the message, right? Because they could have put you out of business, but since they regulate sure. you, they could have said you're, you're not a bank anymore. Just uh, like yeah, that. just like that. Or st what they typically do is stop you from opening any branches, keep you from doing any mergers, basically tie your hands behind your back. So you took excess capital you didn't need. Right. And what do you do? You just stared at it? You just we, put we it just in? just lost money on it. And, 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 and the fact that we didn't need it became self-evident. You may remember after... They did after this process. They did what they, they they a test to be sure you had enough capital. We had way more capital <laughs> than we needed. So it was it cost BB&T fifty, a hundred million dollars that uh, in expenses for money we didn't need. We BB and T never had a loss in, in the quarterly loss. So we couldn't possibly have needed the capital, which is mathematically impossible uh -huh. in, uh, in in this process. But could you have used it as equity to buy up other banks or something? You could have done something, no? Well, well, but but you knew you had to pay it back sometime. And we uh -huh. want, we did we want, it was a, pro, a huge price. The TARP agreement was an amazing agreement. It had this ten thousand things we had to do, and then at the end of the agreement it says. The government that can change any of the rules anytime it wants to, including employing contracts and retirement contracts with with executives. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Would, that, that's that's not an agreement, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> would you enter into an agreement where the other party can change it any way they want to, anytime they want to? Of course. Not. And so you had to, you just stared at that money basically and waited till you could was there a minimum back. time to you couldn't pay it back right away. You couldn't pay it back the next you couldn't day. Couldn't pay it back till they went through the so-called stress test and you had enough capital and they and made all those rules. We were technically the first bank to pay it back, although we had, we beat the other guys by a few minutes. <laughs> but there was a group of us and we were the first bank to pay it back. And to get back to Ayn Rand, I'm just wondering. Um, well, first, did you ever? Uh, meet her. She didn't. Uh, sh she lived to be quite old. No, uh, unfortunately, I never did. Um, I'm told she was chain smoking sh and, and <laughs> a very talkative and uh, short, feisty type type of uh, woman. Um, and you know, sometimes when you study great chefs, you wonder what they have in their fridge at home. <laughs> Do we know anything about how she handled her own business affairs and her own business? Life? Yeah, I happen to be a friend of her intellectual su uh, uh, successor, guy Leonard Petercoff, who's a genius in my opinion, and he's talked to me a lot about Rand. She was a very gracious person. She had a strong accent, so people see her as a lot tougher than she was. I mean, it was, it was a communication issue. You, you look at her personal relationship, she was, you know, she was a very demanding person, as you can expect, but she mm -hmm. was also a very human person. Uh, and she basically uh, lived consistent with her beliefs. She acted. Uh, Did she example, ever go into business, or? No, no, she, but she made a lot of money selling her books, and that was her yeah. business. Yes, well, I mean, of course, she was, yeah, a, she was way, an author, yeah. that was yeah, her money. that's true. But it, it, one of the interesting things, she would, Atlas Shrugged, there was a lot of effort to turn it into a movie, and I, I really wish it had happened, but she wouldn't let it be turned into a movie without her having editorial control, because she mm -hmm. was afraid people would distort the ideas in her movie. Mm -hmm. and so she felt so strongly about her beliefs that she was willing to sacrifice a lot of money, which, I mean, she was living well, but she was willing to sacrifice a lot of money to be sure she, she lived consistent with her philosophy, with her ideas. And of course, Atlas shrugs because the world is getting too heavy to bear. Um, do you see that in the future? How bad can it get from, you, from where you're sitting before it gets better? No, that's a great question. I mean, the, the theme of Atlas Shrugs is what if the men of the mind go on strike? What if the productive business people, the scientists, the engineers, the thoughtful people go on strike? And of course the consequences are a disaster. And to some degree that's what's happening now. The pressure of government regulations, the pressure of taxation are making highly productive people less willing to be productive. They may not just quit, but they don't, you know, they, they invest less, they take less risk, they're less motivated. And, and unfortunately, I think that is going on. Now, I'm not in the pessimist. I think we can turn this around. Mm -hmm. I do believe that ideas drive action. And I believe that the ideas of the left are being exposed as they won't work. I mean, our societies and any socialist type society is having severe financial problems. There is no free lunch at the end of the day. And I think a lot of people get that. 
and, and I'm optimistic we can change those ideas, not without pain, not without some mm -hmm. struggle, mm -hmm. but, but I think we can, can turn them around. But, but I think we need to do it in the next 10 years because if we don't do it relatively soon, it, it does become a mathematical disaster from an economic perspective. And then you have social problems. When, when of course, and yeah, the derived. Well, John Allison, I'm sure you take uh, solace from the fact that her books are selling, so somebody out there is listening. I, I absolutely do. In fact, her sales are at all-time uh, high. And this is a philosophical novel that's over a thousand pages. Mm -hmm. But we have a program on universities that encourages students to read Atlas Shrugged. And we have 25,000 students that go through these programs. And I've had thousands of those students tell me that Atlas Shrugged changed their whole worldview, that it is the most powerful book they've ever read, that they were inspired by it. For those people that believe in free societies, I think it's particularly important because it is the only novel that shows business people as heroes. That, that can can inspire young people and motivate them and and, and, mm -hmm. can, and can give them the energy to fight some of the challenges. So I I, I recommend to anybody that's, that's interested in ideas and wants to get excited to read Alistair. But it's a fun read too. It's a great book. Yeah, it's, it's, it's got <laughs> it's, incredible characters. It's really sure. great. The greatest, I think, heroine of all time uh, in Dagny Taggart. All righty. Well, uh, you, I think you sold a few books right now. So I hope. Thank you so thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Val. Professor John A. Allison of Wake Forest University in North Carolina was our guest this week on the Free Markets series of The World Show. And that's our program for this week. I'm Bob Scully. 